good evening, everyone. This is Bill Maher, and you are listening to Inflection Point, which is a podcast brought to you by Catholic Men for Jesus Christ. And what can I say? I have family with me. Um, my, my dear friend, Xavier Reyes Arol, what a pleasure it is to have you, sir. If you notice the background, our first interview was in Father Tom's living room here. We were sitting across from each other. No fireplace because it's pretty hot out here uh, in, in the end of July. But this is, uh, we have our we have our pelican. Um, but anyway, I want to remind everyone um, about Xavier's book, Revelations, which is a phenomenal um, book on, on the different Catholic prophecies, um, apparitions of Our Lady. We've talked about it quite a bit. It is, it is a must it's a must read and it's a must reference book too, because you'll, you'll find yourself going back to it uh, quite often in the times we live in. And you also have your own podcast now. So I just started. Uh, just, I tell you, it's mine too. It's called the uh, Oak Hooks of a Media. Mm. And, uh, it was actually the uh, idea of Mrs. Uh, Moniti. We used to work before with the uh, heart and refuge of the end of times. Uh, she wanted to fly with her own wings, so she asked me to join, and so I did. And we're doing uh, we're doing quite well. We're doing a lot, a lot of shows, and uh, I'm doing one actually after yours with her. Oh, is that you know? It, it's um, it's two great people on that show, Xavier. You were, you know, it's funny people ask, you know, or or they'll write in their comments. Xavier seems like such a gentleman, and he is. I've had him in my living room. This, the man you see on the podcast is the man indeed. So, and, and, you know, I get the same feeling from Monique as well. She, she seems like such a good human being. Well, I don't mind saying this publicly, but uh, as far as you are concerned and your family, and that is without being plastic, I do not, first of all, get close to anyone. You, your lovely wife, your beautiful children, it was, I could not, it was irresistible. I really got very close to all of them. I love them all. I really do. And I think of you as really as if your, your last name was the same as mine. It's extraordinary. Being involved in all these circles, how God um, uh, um, writes straight on curved lines. And mm. you're a, a member of my family. Oh, likewise. And a feeling mutual from my clan as well. And it's, uh, it's, the cool thing about the internet is it, it is a, like, as Michael Matt will say, it's a uniting of the clans. Yes. So many different quadrants can come together that you'd never be able to do 10 years ago or 15 years ago. It's very true. We, we did just that, you and me, on the 27th of last month. We, we participated together in a gathering of clans. I mm. tried to reach uh, Michael Matt because it was his idea. I was not able to get through with him, to him. I would have loved for him to have come uh, because he's a terrific gentleman. But yes, we gathered over 21 Catholic channels from both sides of the Atlantic, France, Scotland, England, Canada, the States, various countries from the Southern American Hemisphere. We did remarkably well and we all gathered and we all had our hearts beating as one. While mm. we were interviewing Father Michel, listening to a message and um, it was extraordinary and it was unprecedented in the history of YouTube. We've done something extraordinary and truly with the heart. It was remarkable. Yeah, no, participated I, with me. I, yeah, it, was, it was my honor. Uh, and fascinating, since then, um, you sent me a, a little blurb from your book, uh, one of the, the, the prophecies that Father Rodrigue, Rodrigue mentioned seems to have sort of come true. Maybe you can share a little bit about that before we start. Yes. Um, in 2018, uh, Father Michel uh, received a prophecy from God the Father saying that uh, first and foremost, the very, 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 very few people only in high places knew that when uh, um, Donald Trump was uh, president, there was a hidden attempt to his life. It was not mentioned uh, for many reasons. No. But the verse, uh, God the Father told Father Michel, you will see very, in a, sometimes in a few years, uh, soon, there will be another one. They will mm. attempt to his life again. And that is because, according to God the Father, uh, Trump is um, a free man who will not be influenced uh, by an under the, uh, by an under shadow government of sorts. And he, God the Father told Father Michel, Trump is, no, is not a saint, but uh, he is a blessing uh, to the country. 
for many reasons, although he's not perfect and commits mistakes. Yeah. Father Michel did announce, or rather repeated, the prophecy that was given to him, and I sent you the passage in my book on chapter 9, where uh, God said, indeed, there will be another attempt to his life. It happened exactly as that. Yeah, it did. And that's an, a great example as to why you need the book, because I had the book and read the book, and I didn't remember that. <laughs> There's so much in it. Lord. It's but that's it's an amazing reference guide and and what you did to unpack for the world Marie Julie Jenny the English speaking world um, has been an immense service because everyone's heard about Fatima if you're if you're a Catholic right um, maybe less so things like Akita and, and good success and places like that but but Marie Julie Jenny has been an enigma or or unknown I should say to many people in the English speaking world for a long time so that was a, a great service and an amazing woman that I cl clearly believe is a saint. You know, you make this point on a lot of podcasts that not one of her predictions has ever not come true. And that's, that's, um, that's, I, I don't want to say scary because we are a people of the gospel and the gospel is good news, right? But suffering, you know, is painful. <laughs> so on that level, um, it's sobering uh, what, what she predicted for the future. And, it, and so much of it seems to be pointed to today. She did. She did exactly that. Um, this book I wrote, the, the largest chapter that I wrote on this book is about her, even more so than Fatima. When I wrote this book, I really tried, you know, I tried to write a book that I would have loved to have found, mm. uh, that contained everything I wanted to know. It, it took me three years of my life mm. to, to write this book in research alone. And it has the secrets of Latin. It has a second half hidden secret of Fatima, which we mm. got thanks to Cardinal Ottaviani's uh, work through the uh, testimony of Cardinal uh, Hatzinger before he became Pope Benedict XVI. We got uh, the message, the secrets, the five secrets that were revealed to Bernadette to people from Lourdes. Yeah, Lourdes. I had no idea until I read your book that there were secrets, prophetic secrets of Lourdes. And four of the five have already come true. Yes. And the fifth, Parts of it have come true. Yes, we're in this, the, the mystery. Yeah, yeah. But the matter about this book, also with uh, Marie Julie Jahini, holds, uh, as you said, all the future events, and that is what is alarming. Well, as you said, it's a message of hope, because at the end it ends well. We see the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary mm. and the restoration of the Catholic Church to its fullest glory. But we, before the resurrection, this got to be a crucifixion. Yes. Thank God in here, for the events that are to come, there's everything for the preparation. How to prepare for the three days of darkness, how to prepare for your home, protection, all the uh, remedies, particularly for one ghastly uh, new pandemic that is going to make uh, COVID-19 look like a big thing. Yeah. It's going to be very, we've got everything in here. Everything is there. Pictures of all the um, of the sacramentals that uh, heaven is asking the faithful to wear, uh, every single um, piece of remedy for every single malady that is to come. It took three years that is finally finished, and to be honest with you, I've been not expecting to be such a success. And um, it's now in Spanish, I'm about to start the French. I thought twice, still, before I wrote this talk. I discussed it with my wife and to begin this entire campaign of podcast because, yes, it's fun. You get to meet extraordinary people and to develop friendships. No, to extend your family. Truly. Yeah. And it's not just blah, blah. It's the truth. There's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And I know likewise. this likewise. I know. And this is extraordinary. But at the same time, there is another side of the coin. And that's the threats. That's the enemies you make. And very dangerous ones as well. So we thought twice before we launched ourselves in this campaign, my wife and I. We have two young children. You know? But my wife told me, and after we discussed together, we agreed that it's a way to say merci, a way to say thank you for everything we've got uh, in my life, in our lives, particularly these two months. And um, so it is not really a, um, an instrument to get in a higher station of society. It really it was... Um, a way to participate in a war, a mobilization, a spiritual mobiliz mobilization of souls that heaven is sending through all these apparitions, calling people 
the rice, to carry the, the standard, to carry the banner. Yeah. We're going to talk about that a little bit. In fact, um, we haven't even gotten into the topic of this podcast. Um, so I, I will launch it honoring my, my French brethren, Don Le Breche Zouvé. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's doing better than I do. I worked on that a lot, actually, to be honest with you. <laughs> I can barely speak English. <laughs> I grew up right outside of New York. Yeah, you can't speak English. But um, so the whole purpose of this podcast, or the topic, I should say, is spiritual boot camp. But spiritual boot camp from already being in the foxhole, because we're in the foxhole right now, and we need to prepare. You know, so many great podcasts have have been on what's coming and so forth but we want to dive a little bit into what you can do listening to this or, or what you can maybe additionally color your life with i mean so many people listen to this already probably have a deep spiritual life or at least they're seeking well well maybe you can get some ideas so the idea would be we could talk a little bit about sacramentals um, we could talk about prayers and devotions and I'll, I will kick off um, this quite with the first question being sacramentals. What are your thoughts and how can people enrich their lives by utilizing sacramentals? And, and what are those as um, sacramentals themselves? Right. Uh, sacramentals are objects, holy objects, such as medals, uh, rosaries, objects that are supposed to be a new armor a new shields, a new sword. Uh, you, of all people, uh, should appreciate that, uh, Bill, since you are uh, what we call here, in my country at least, in, uh, in France, a uh, chevalier of modern times, and you love knighthoods, and you love the stories. We do. Of, uh, the knights and the templars. Uh, in this instance, and with all seriousness, uh, in the apparition sites that I've studied and I write about in my books, uh, the immense majority of them, all the faithful, uh, and even the, late, the latest message we received from Father Michel, you'll remember on June the 27th, the Virgin Mary says that the sacramentals repels the evil of, in, every, uh, for, of, in all its forms. So sacramentals are holy objects that are always blessed by a priest and that we are supposed either to use or to wear upon our persons. So, in, since you mentioned a few moments ago, Marie-Julie Jacquini, she was unquestionably one of the visionaries or seers, in addition of being one, she was also a stigmatist, who received a tremendous uh, index of sacramentals uh, for uh, the faithful to wear, to protect themselves, and even in one case, to protect their children, mm -hmm. uh, their purity and uh, Let's begin with the basics. Okay. The Virgin Mary, and all this is approved by the Roman Catholic Apostolic Church. Uh, the Catholic Church uh, has approved and encourages the faithful to wear upon their persons, always, first and foremost, the crucifix with the corpus. Always and everything that I will mention must automatically, it goes to that saying, be blessed. Be blessed. By the Roman Catholic uh, So, the, the Holy Crucifix. We are encouraged to wear upon a person what we call the Miraculous Medal from the Rue du Bac in Paris. Uh, it's a miraculous medal. It's called the miraculous medal for a particular reason, as, it, as its name indicates. It has been attributed to a multitude of miracles across the world, miracles that have not been able to be explained to this day. It is truly, and the Virgin Mary has repeated it again and again in places like uh, Marie-Julie Janine, La Faudère, among other places, Akita also in. Uh, Britannia and Saint Nicolas all approved the parish of Saint. The miraculous medal must be worn upon your, your person and blessed, of course, by a priest. Another particular and most important sacramental, the holy. Well, before we get to that, let's dive a little bit into the uh, miraculous medal. That's Saint Catherine Labore, right? What's the background to that medal? The the background of the host history, you mean? Yeah, the history. Well, uh, Saint Catherine Labore was a sister of the charity. Was, she was there uh, in the early 19th century, 1830s. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, on one instance, uh, began to appear to her. One day, one night, she was, St. Catherine Abouet, awakened by her guardian angel. Remarkably enough, she was not really frightened. She followed her guardian angel all the way to the chapel. 
of the Miraculous Chapel in, in La Rue du Bac. Rue means street. So it's called the Street du Bac uh, in France. I mean, my parents, my mother in particular, used to take me and my brother to live there all the time. And above the altar, you see in golden letters all the requests that will be asked of me before this altar will be responded. Then on the right hand side, you see most and foremost the uh, incorrupt body of mm -hmm. St. Catherine Labouret in a glass casket. She's in uniform with her, her hands joined with a rosary in her hands. And people usually touch her casket with uh, their miraculous medals or with uh, their rosaries. And they do pray before the other. During Christmas time, uh, the place is filled with uh, every time, every Christmas, I saw a lot of patients feeling the place and the French from France were in the rear and letting the Haitians sing their beautiful songs. There were hardly any pair of eyes that was dry when you hear these uh, beautiful Christians uh, praying to Virgin Mary, calling her Maman, which in French means mm. mother, a mommy. You know? so the French, have... French Creole they speak. Yes, some of them speak actually French with a heavy accent, but there is French Creole, of course, and some of them speak French, and it's beautiful. It's absolutely remarkable. So that chapel of the Rue du Bac, of the Miraculous Medal, has a, as much importance, I would say, as a medal itself. It's a form of pilgrimage. Even mm. for Parisians to go there, it constitutes a pilgrimage. Now, what I will tell you about the Miraculous Medal is quite important. Um, we have to be careful, because, uh, as we all know, uh, we are not particularly friendly with the Freemasons. No, they are not. <laughs> <laughs> I know where you're going with this. Yes. Uh, the Freemasons, uh, since the, the dawn of time, well, they started really beginning, began to exist in uh, the early 18th century, 1717. They originally became from a first lodge that came from Scotland. Then, oh, there you go. And, uh, I don't know if you can see, but the star is on the back, right? Yes. Yeah. So... The Freemasons have hit, have made uh, a copy, a bad copy of the Miraculous Medal. And uh, you will see, for instance, among other things, and Father René Laurentin, when I used to work with him, oh my gosh, we had so many discussions about this matter. And he even went to the chapel of the Miraculous Medal to speak with Mother Superior, and they had a huge fight. I didn't know where to place myself. If I could uh, hide under a rock, I would have. But, and Father Laurent, usually is very phlegmatic, would not show anymore. He was blooming cold. He was ferocious. Mm. In any case, the point of that is the Freemasons have managed to make this miraculous medal that look very much like the original, except in the back, uh, instead of having six stars on the side of the large cross with a bar and the M that is underneath the, the cross, the M stands for Mary at the feet. Now, so there are six stars on the right flank of the cross, six stars on the left flank. The Freemasons have the blooming idea of putting a star above the cross and to put six stars from the top to the bottom and the other side as well. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah, the star superseding over the cross. Absolutely. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Like God the Father and or the Holy Spirit. Nothing else. So in this instance, uh, that is one of the of the attacks of the Freemasonry. Those symbols, seem, it might seem that this detail is rubbish. So it has an yeah. order of great value. And also sometimes between the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart, at the bottom of that particular part of the medal, you know, the Freemasons put some sort of symbols like rays and rectangles. That is a significance that is Luciferian. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of uh, exorcists talk about that. Well, how can that be a big deal? It's, it's about the intent. So um, there's an intent to do evil. And in some people that nothing's going to happen. If you, for, I'll give you a great example. Growing up in my household, I ended up inheriting like all of the old plastic rosaries that were in my household. My mother would get, you know, people would, in church and stuff would give rosaries, right? Well, a lot of them were Masonic and they had Masonic symbols on there that I had no idea to bring them all to Father Tom to be destroyed. But you know what? Does that mean that there would be something wrong for a holy person praying? Probably not. 
but there's an intent to do harm. There's an intent to do evil. And in someone who's maybe struggling with something, it could lead to something bad theoretically. And this is, we get this from Father Gabriel and Morth and so many of the other exorcists. So in that scenario, if you have one of those miraculous medals, if you have weird symbols on the cross of your rosary, plastic El Chipo rosaries, they're probably Masonic. Bring them to a priest that will take that serious so that they can be properly destroyed. So I end my commercial. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do be careful. Do be very careful. You can check on the internet the true miraculous medal from the Rudy Bach, and it has to be exactly like that. And nothing, nothing above the cross of our Lord. Yeah. Um, we discussed about the, uh, the Holy Crucifix. We discussed about the miraculous medal. Now there is another matter, another sacramental great importance, a treasure. Yes. We're talking about the um, uh, scapula of Mont Carmel. There you go. Yeah, I'm actually drying it off. So I, I, I did a deep plunge into cold water today and did sprints. I'm trying to get healthy. So it was super wet. So I had it in my pocket. That's I'm drying it off. That's why it's not around my neck. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> so for those of you who are not familiar with the promise of the brown scapula, the scapula of Mont Carmel, your favorite saint, right? Yes, an Englishman. <laughs> <laughs> and then time and stop. But look, God is merciful. He has to choose sometimes even an Englishman. Okay? He, that's a proof there. <laughs> so at least one. <laughs> no, I, I'm very Anglophile. I'm just joking. It's a, <laughs> very, a tremendous French joke. But in 1250, the Virgin Mary appeared with her son Jesus as a child on one hour. And on the right hand, she had that particular brand scapula that Bill just showed with a remarkable cross. The Virgin Mary promised everyone, on a non obstant or regardless of what sort of life or crimes or sins they committed, she solemnly promised that any soul, at the moment of his or her life, of her death, rather, uh, carry or wear upon their persons the holy scapula of Mont Carmel, will never ever suffer the fires of the world. It's an amazing promise. It's amazing. That, couldn't, that doesn't mean you go to straight to paradise. It would very likely mean that you'd have to go to purgatory. Purgatory, remember, is a place that is between heaven and hell. Yeah. This is recognized and approved by the church. It is not eternal. Everyone goes, to, those who go to purgatory, rather, will be there temporarily. It could be for a long time to yeah. wash away all the sins that you've committed in your life to finally enter heaven in a dignified manner. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's worth talking a little bit about purgatory. A lot of people have a misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. Remember, Christ says that nothing impure shall enter. And I don't know about you, Xavier, but if I got hit by a bus right now, ah, I'm not so pure. You know, I, I'm dealing with my issues, right? And that's really all of us. We're fallen. We're broken. And God, as the ultimate lover, has given us the gift. It's a gift. Purgatory is a gift where we, where we purify. The God's love purifies us. And it might, you know, that imagery of fire and suffering and all that's there because you're separated from God. You know, the great suffering of purgatory is separation from God. When you know definitive, we act on faith today. You know, well, I, I believe in God, you know, but yeah, I don't know. Do we? Yeah, we do. But half the time, we're not, more than half the time, we're not even thinking about God. Whereas in purgatory, you, you, the logos is before you. You know, there's no, there's no doubt. Faith is gone. It's, it's, it's an actuality. You know it. And yet you can't be there. And that is the great, one of the great sufferings of purgatory for sure. But it's a gift because you're being purified of all the garbage you have, the attachment to sin. Think about all the times, the little things you do and I do and all that stuff that we're, we're still attached to sin in different ways, you know? You know, even worrying about money is in a certain sense attached to sin. Christ said, look at the birds, you know? You know? And, so that it's a loss of all that attachment. So purgatory is a great gift. And I did want to, I wanted to spell that out because there's such misconceptions as to what this amazing gift of God is. Because God's not a liar. Nothing impure will enter. He's pure justice, but pure mercy too. Purgatory is the mercy. 
and I got to put my scapula back on. <laughs> well, I got my microphone, so we're going to wear it like this for a little while. But uh, anyway, I digress. The scapula. No, no, but it's very important. It was very important you mentioned that. My, uh, when my father uh, passed away, um, my nephew, uh, who wasn't there, um, called the hospital, uh, as we all did, but he did on his own, which I thought mm. was remarkable, and was making sure that the nurse, just before my father was passing away, uh, left the couple on my father's purse and inside on, her, on his neck. He was not permitted. So he said, please put it on his ankle, put it on somewhere on his body, but he must right. wear it. He was at the, at, on his deathbed. And she did, thanks to him. So I'm immensely grateful to my nephew, Peter, who is responsible for that. Uh, my grandfather, a brief, uh, brief anecdote, if we have the time. Uh, I love it. Run with it. Uh, I have a grandfather, French, of course, who was a veteran of World War One. He joined the um, uh, French army. He wore the uniform joined the colors as soon as the war started in 1914. Mm. He left the army in 19, when the war was over after November 11th, 1918. And his job, he was a corporal, not even an officer, but he was a, what we call a brancardier. His job was first of all to charge with the troops, and at night to go in no man's land and try to gather all the wounded back to the French trenches. And uh, it was night, but he was imprudent. The, the sun didn't quite set yet. You know, uh, when um, he went, to, he was hearing his comrades calling, George, George, I can't stop it. The pain is awful. Come, come, get me. Mm -hmm. He was doing it. He still was alive. And whenever the night was falling down, the Germans were shooting lights, uh, last, um, flares, yep. so that they could see the no man's land. And as he was picking up one of his comrades, pow, a bullet hit him right in the heart. My grandfather fell backwards, lost consciousness, only to wake up about maybe an hour, a little less than an hour later. Got back on, uh, on sitting down, immediately opened his shirt. He didn't find any blood, and he found the German bullet of the sniper completely smashed again. Mm. Um, a scapular medal of gold that he got buried. I wouldn't wow. be here right now speaking to you if it weren't for that miracle. No. Wow. And that's extraordinary. The scapula, all these particular sacramentals are truly, truly armors, shields, and swords in these modern times of armor. Mm. It was a quick analogy. I just wanted to tell you. No, I love that story. And that a sniper round is a pretty large caliber bullet. Yes. So, you know, a little, you know, a little metal or a piece of cloth should not stop it. Should not. That, that's clearly a miracle. You're a miracle child. <laughs> well, my grandfather showed us medal. It was it was a big medal of, of gold like this, and it had been straightened, but you still could see the lining. You could guess that it had been. It was not normal. It was not. Normal. It was deformed at that point. Yeah. It was deformed, and he got buried with that particular medal. Wow. And, uh, no, truly, I wouldn't be here. No, my brother. No, my children. None of us would be here if it weren't for that extraordinary miracle. But uh, it impacted so much my grandfather that, uh, and he told us a story, and we grew up with that particular devotion. And one of the reasons is that. I believe that, yeah. I mean, that'll transform you fast. Now, there's a lot of miracles from scapulas, you know, storms in the sea, throwing it in, and calm, although I, I don't think I'd part with my scapula, but um, there's absolutely a, a, a treasure trove of historic stories of the scapula doing very similar to what happened with your grandfather. Yes. My daughter, I have two scapular medals. One that I got since from my mother when I was a boy. It's very small, but it's been blessed. It's been placed upon me by the first time by a Carmelite priest. When Before it was obligatory for a Carmelite to put it first on you the very first time. And if you lost it or if you broke it, then you could buy one and put it back on yourself after, afterwards. It's, that yes. rule still goes. But now there is a change in the sense that uh, now any priest of any order can yeah. do it. Before it was only Carmelite who could do it. And my daughter bought me this other last You know, the thing about being a Catholic is we have so many good sacramentals. It's like we're gangsters. We got all, you know, we got all kinds of stuff going on. 
No, you look like a Russian marshal of sorts. But uh, this is the scapula medal today that you can find in oh, any wow. religious shop. No? Here you I've seen them a little bit different too. Yes. In the shape of a cross. Like, for example, Laura Ingram wears one on Fox News, but it's in the shape of a cross. I wonder, I wonder if, you know, that, that's a good one. Do we, you know, you could easily be scrupulous about things like this because there are some quadrants that say it has to be cloth. I was incarnated by a Carmelite. Actually, I was incarnated uh, into the scapula by a Carmelite from Canada, French speaking, Quebec, who went back to France to reestablish the Carmelites in France. He died wow. recently. Let that sink in. How many amazing Carmelite priests and, and religious in history and saints, and he had to reestablish the Carmelites in France. It's a frightening thought. but It's so necessary. Yeah. And particularly in these times. Of life. So that's the scapula. Um, yeah, well, well, let's clarify, because some people say it has to be cloth. Some people say no. What, what is your take on that? Because there's a little bit of a Catholic controversy. Yes. It's not a controversy at all. Uh, both are acceptable by the church. Uh, the church has submitted the medal uh, to be propagated, particularly in places of tropical areas because of the heat. Mm -hmm. so, uh, for the other people that are allergic to the wool, uh, it's permitted. It's been granted by the church. So you can wear either the, the cloth one, which you have. I have one at, uh, in my nightstand, which sometimes I wear, and the medal as well which is some, somewhat easier. I don't have to take it off when I go in the shower. Well, that's the thing, durability. Yeah, you sleep, uh, in the shower, you uh, break your neck, that's it, you don't have it. Uh, good luck, pal. <laughs> you know, and that's a good point. You know, for example, I, my cold plunge, I had to take it off, but I just, but I put it in my pocket. So yeah, there's, that's, that's, that's legitimate, whether it's tropical or not, you know, showers or or whatever. And that's uh, the most important thing with all. It's for me to you made me feel better about that. <laughs> so I appreciate that. So uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was um, holy water. Holy water is a sacramental. Exercise salt, things like that. Absolutely. Actually, I think, every, yep. Here we have. Every well, house should have. Every house. Uh, again, many times, uh, again with Marie de Janine. She requests the frequent use of holy water in the house on our persons, on our children, on our front doors and windows and houses. With Father Michel Rodrigue, uh, he invites us as well, um, echoing again the words of God the Father, uh, to use in our house, to consecrate it to the Sacred Heart of Christ and to the Immaculate Heart of Mary with exercised water and the garden, or if you have a land property, to, sure. To bless it with exercised salt. Yes. So those are two sacramentals of the utmost importance. Exercise means it receives a special ritual, a special blessing from. It could be any priest. It doesn't have to be an exorcist. No. But there is a particular prayer that uh, every priest is allowed to exercise, uh, and which repels to uh, an utmost extreme the devils and all the fallen angels that follow. Say, you know, they cannot stand it. It's something that is like fire for us. For them, it's exercise water and exercise something else. So this is the utmost protection as far as sacramentals are concerned for the homes, for the properties, and for your person. So that uh, it's funny. We I just had Father Rippinger on um, podcast uh, like a week ago. And he said, if you have teenagers, then you could throw a little exercise salt into the uh, pasta sauce for them. <laughs> So we can consume it, actually, which is which is awesome. Um, so exercise salt. Um, I have epiphany water too, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Father Tom got me a lot of epiphany water. But these these are things that I'll tell you even a personal story actually on that. So um, years ago, I read Father Gabriel Morth's books. Um, he was the one that sort of I, put the idea of a diabolic uh, activity. On the, front, on the front pages, if you will, of the Catholic world, right? Uh, as an exorcist in Rome and all that. But I, you know, many years ago, there was some uh, preternatural stuff going on in my household on, on a couple occasions. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. But Father Gabriel recommended putting a combination of exercise salt, oil, and holy water. And to go around 
where this was on each windowsill and make the sign of the cross and pray the Our Father. And he said that that would very often just, that stuff would end. And it did. It did. So these sacramentals do have efficacy. You create an environment that evil just doesn't want to be around. Yeah. And, um, and I think uh, that's a personal story where I, I saw that in two occasions um, in, my, in my, my life with my family, for sure. Yes. Um, I bought, the last time I went to the Holy Land, I went to the Jordan River. And I got mm. in, a, in an old bottle of, that was empty and clean, of a Puig, uh, English, or French. Lavender. Uh, I emptied it, I completely cleaned it, and I filled it with um, with water from the river, of, which is dirty. But somehow, the one I gathered was quite transparent. Mm. And for the baptism, for instance, of my two chipmunks, my children, I should say, my daughter asked me never to, to refer to her anymore with one of those baby in English. So on their baptism, I mixed a bit of that water with the uh, water of Lourdes. Mm-hmm. And also with blessed water, and uh, it's a lovely thing to and to have them blessed by a priest, of course. I mentioned we're blessed with that. Blessed water is of is ever so important. It seems so superficial for people who hear it for the first time. It is not. It is truly necessary. Otherwise, heaven would not send his the mother of Christ again and again to encourage the faithful to do so. Those are protections against the enemy of God. For the enemy of God uses every single possible instrument they can to direct you to your perdition, even yeah. television, radio, music, so through subliminal messages, rock music, rap, and so on. And so on. We have to counteract all this with the same instruments, more powerful than those that are being offered to us by heaven for heaven's message. So it's not ridiculous, it is sincerely something of the utmost importance. Particularly yeah. in regard to what Father Michel has told us, he asks us to bless our homes and to consecrate ourselves with this blessed exercise water uh, by blessing every four corner of the house with this particular um, exercise water, with a small prayer which is in the book as well, which just to give you the outlines is a statement to God that you declare that you consecrate this home. In, uh, to the Sacred Heart of Christ, to the Sacred Heart, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that you give your home to God. It is no longer yours. And that you accept whomever God sends into this home seeking sanctuary. This would be for a um, temporary or permanent future refuge. But it is a place for refuge. Once you do, God the Father told Father Michel that your home, your property, if you bless it with salt, salt because it penetrates the earth, will become literally um, a spiritual bunker. And um, I, I think it's, those are words that, that, that hold a tremendous importance. Of course, God will respect our uh, freedom if we decide not, not, to, not to do so. He will respect our choice. Yeah, no, well, it, radically so, actually. You know, it's, um, there's a precedent for that, um, even when you think about Our Lady of Exterior, Exterior Goods, where you're, you're giving everything to Mary. I've, I've done that. And, and my patron, St. Joseph, uh, maybe we could talk about saints in a minute. But, um, but there's even, you mentioned Lord's Water, there's Lord's Water, there's uh, the little pebbles from St. Michael's Cave. There's so many of these beautiful little, I look at them as like airdrops from God. You know, different points in history, he, he's constantly raining down these gifts without suspending our freedom. Because people say, well, why won't God just appear to me? Well, that would be put a lot on you, actually. You know, the, we often talk about, you know, what save a, might save a lot of people is the eighth sacrament, which is ignorance. <laughs> so, you know, be careful what you wish for. With more knowledge comes more responsibility. Um, and God is the great lover and, and the lover stoops to conquer. Um, and he loves each of us. So that's my thought on that. Um, what, what about the rosary? St. Dominic, right? Uh, St. Dominic, exactly. They even made a song about him. Uh, the little nuns from Belgium. You're familiar with us? With I'm song? not. That uh, the little nuns from Belgium used to sing that song. It became very popular in the United States. They changed the words into English. But in France, it was in the 60s very popular. Saint Dominique was um, was the saint who 
received the instruction on how to pray the Holy Rosary on the mm. Blessed Virgin Mary. And indeed, uh, Padre Pio used to say that of all the weapons, all the spiritual weapons, this is the most powerful uh, thing. The weapon, so, yeah. Every major apparition starts, beginning with the La Salette, uh, be, going on forth with uh, Tilly, with Fatima. Uh, the Virgin Mary always requires us to pray, if we can, every day, the Holy Rosary. In France, a rosary means 15 mysteries. I know that in the States it doesn't mean, so it could be 15 or 5. A chaplet in France means 5. But, um, my, for instance, me and my children, we don't do it every day, almost every day. It depends on circumstance. So we, we, we pray in front of this statue of um, Our Lady of Fatima. We light the candle. And we pray in the children. Uh, the way we do it, it's, it gives a certain taste, an atmosphere which is really charming. And the children became to really like it. It's like, you know how you have this particular feeling at Christmas, or no, the smell. In Normandy, mm. we used to throw <laughs> mandarin peels to the fire, and it produced a tremendous perfume in the living room. You know? That was for us, memory of Christmas. With us, it's uh, sometimes the mother makes coffee or something, and we pray in peace, slowly, without making a race against the clock. It's absolutely charming. It's lovely. Mm. And uh, the Virgin invites us to pray every day. And as I said, Padre Pio uh, says this is the most powerful tool of all. And one last uh, anecdote on my part. Uh, in Austria, after World War II, you know that how uh, Austria, like Germany, was divided in um, five occupation zones. So there yes. were actually four. The Russians, the Americans, the English, and the French like Germany, like Berlin. So Austria, um, because Adolf Hitler was Austrian actually, not German, uh, was suffering the consequences of this war. And uh, when the new uh, chancellor, newly elected chancellor of Austria, who was a remarkable person, I, I will butcher the pronunciation of his name in fact, right, so I will not. But um, he was Catholic and wanted to return his country to total freedom and change and asked all the foreign troops to leave the country. So he began to, on radio, to address all the Austrian uh, citizens and to begin a campaign of rosaries for the liberation of Austria and so that uh, uh, Austria would remain neutral and not participate in the Cold War, which would, in his thought at the time, eventually lead to a third world war. Mm. And so the entire country listened to the Chancellor and prayed every day for a few months uh, the rosary it was echoed on the radio. Everyone followed through. For the great majority of the population, the Austrian population is renowned to be devoutly Catholic. To this yes, day. yes. So they did until finally, unexplainably, it was mutually agreed in a time when nobody wanted to release any territory so that the Russians would leave part of Austria, the Americans the southern uh, part, the English the northern. The north uh, western and the French um, no the southwestern and the French northwestern area of Austria. Austria became itself again and decided not to join NATO or the uh, Warsaw Pact. Remain a neutral nation in this Cold War and remained free ever since. And that was because of the intercession of the Austrian people for the prayer of the Holy Rosary. Yeah, no, mir my gosh, the miracles of the rosary. Was it Nagasaki? I think it was Nagasaki, not Hiroshima, yeah. where the church, pretty close to the blast site of that nuke, um, was not leveled. Everything else was. And the priests were, did not suffer radiation. They were fine. Why? Because that was a house where they prayed the rosary. So a lot of people, um, if you're not Catholic, you're looking at these beads and you're thinking, what is this, like idol worship? No, you don't worship the beads. They're a tool to take you down in meditation. You're meditating upon the mysteries of Christ and the mysteries of the gospel. You're, 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 you're praying, as Father Tom would say, you know, you're, you're saying the prayers, it's almost like background music to the meditation that you're visualizing is going on. And there's so many of them, obviously, they're, it's all from the scriptures. So this is a deep, deep meditation. And um, you think about it for 15 minutes or whatever it takes to do a chaplet of five, um, for our French, um, you know, you, how often do you do you pray for 15 minutes in your life? You know, you're focusing on God. I often think of, you know, before the fall, 
it's almost like Adam and Eve had an umbilical cord to God, that they were constantly focused on God and not themselves. Joyfully, and this was joy. And sin ripped that out, and then everything turned inward. And we're constantly turned inward. And here is here's us utilizing our intellect and our will, and we're literally turning our eyes back to God imperfectly but we're turning back, we're we're focusing back. And that's what the rosary does beautifully. And and obviously there's miracles because of it and there's transformations because of it. Jordan Peterson's wife converted to Catholicism because of the rosary. And there's so many others like that, other stories, powerful stuff. It is absolutely true. I have a friend of mine um, who is the, he was there on the 27th with uh, a conference uh, he was a captain of the of one of the French channels who was there. Uh, Cyril is his name. He's right now in Medjugorje. And he was making a live show. Um, you could hear all the rosaries being prayed in Medjugorje, in Italian, in German, in French. It, it's absolutely glorious. It's no wonder that the devil cannot stand the prayer of the mm-hmm. rosary. It's, you leave the mysteries that you pray for because you picture them in your head as you pray the uh, Hail Marys and the Our Father. Yeah. You are there. It's, and I think when you participate, in a way, it's you, you make a form of communion, common union with Christ in his own life by meditating, by feeling the sympathy, the pain, the, the stuff mm. you went through. And that's what this rosary does. And uh, it is today, I believe, a modern source in this spiritual world we are we are all involved whether we like it or not yeah i agree so much it, it's critically important and it's it's sort of a a multifunctional tool because you can also pray the chaplet of divine mercy let's talk a little bit about the chaplet oh yes the chaplet that comes from the, the apparition site of krakow to sister faustina just before world war ii and uh, yes, this particular um, prayer of the chaplet, it's only the, you only pray the five decades, um, where at the end you say always, uh, Jesus, I trust in you. And uh, this particular prayer, actually Father Michel told me a story that part of the United States or the greatest part of the United States will be protected during some events that are to come. And our Lord and brother, God the Father stated, and that's because America prays the chaplet of divine mercy. Mm. It is a, a loving manner to implore pardon, to implore mercy to God with all our hearts, uh, before the before our consciences to God. And uh, Sister Faustina is the one who uh, who was uh, chosen to bring forth to the faithful this extraordinary devotion, another treasure from heaven. No, it's beautiful. I, I, um, I mentioned this to Father Rippinger on our last podcast, that it's as a father, it's a beautiful devotion to teach your young children because they have no attention, especially little boys, you know, whereas the chaplet is sort of short. It's devotional. You teach them how to meditate on, on, I, I use the sorrowful mysteries when I pray the chaplet. That's just my meditation, but it's, you know, in seven, eight minutes, you're kind of done. So it's a great way of teaching them, you know, and, and moving them up to the rosary, especially when they're very, very young and they just don't have the attention. Uh, I, at least in, in my situation, I found that to be very useful for sure. And actually, uh, hearkening back to the last podcast, Father actually mentioned that there are some diabolic influences and in, in, in some things that people struggle from that the chaplet in particular is extremely efficacious at helping. Uh, and then I refer you back to the last podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Taking advantage of a new audience. But um, but yeah, the Chapel of Divine Mercy, a uh, beautiful, beautiful prayer. Um, and certainly if anyone's p- dying, you want to pray that chapel. There's some, some very specific promises. Oh, yeah. Um, you know that uh, Sister Sasagawa from Akita? Yes. Uh, today is in... Uh... Tents of care, right? Yes, she's on her deathbed. Mm. According to the those uh, nurses and doctors who are taking care of her, uh, the time is now. Mm. So uh, you mentioned earlier my the podcast where I work now with Mani. The other day, I found out 
we did a chaplet of divine mercy with all we had about a thousand people live oh wow we said, let's all pray the chaplet of, the, of divine mercy for her mm. and we unite and gather one thousand chaplets of divine mercy for her you can imagine the tremendous good uh, that uh, this will make and um and now uh what we're going to do uh, tonight uh, in a couple in a couple of hours two three hours now with uh Monique, we're going to be talking also about what happened in Paris. We're going to uh, we're going to invite all the people who will watch. I will invite you because you are de facto an honorary member of, uh, as well of our party. I'm there. <laughs> we're going to ask everyone to, this coming Sunday when they all go to mass independently, simply to offer uh, all the thousands of viewers to offer in union in prayer. Screaming the word "O Cook Save," which means "All Hell to the Cross," we're going to offer it up as an act of reparation for the blasphemy and infamy that took place last Friday in my country, in Paris, oh, at the, the Olympics. So I invite you, mon ami, mon frère, oh, to participate with us. I would love to. I would love to. You know, it's a uh, not to derail our topic, but it's you know, it's um. The devil's in your face now. He used to hide. He's in your face now. So, uh, you know, I, I had a, we had a podcast with Mark Houck and Dan Duddy. Mark Houck was the guy who was uh, raided by the FBI. Great man, friend. And uh, unfortunately, Dan had really bad internet. So that podcast ended up being wasted. So we're re-airing it. We're going to re-shoot it because it was, it was very good podcast on persecution. Um, where I'm going with this is persecution is coming. Because he's out in the open right now. And that Olympics was a heck of a good example of how in the face right now Satan is um, in the world, for sure. Painful. Very painful. Yes, that's what we, that's what you and I discussed, even off camera. Even when I came to visit you, uh, I know it sounds an exaggeration. It seems very, very theatrical. But now, the it's almost impossible to ignore what we've seen, what we see around us, what we see even in our respective governments. My country in France, you've seen the state of mediocrity that it has displayed a few days ago. I think every major country right now is falling to the temptation of war, cupidity, yeah. uh, ambition, and uh, love for war. We, and even within our immediate circles, uh, the good thing about what is happening right now is that even within the church, the masks are off. Yes. We must continue to pray for the Pope. Very much so. He needs Absolutely. our prayers and uh, be illuminated, guided by God. We agree. But the important thing is observing, taking a step backward with a cold head, an objective head, observing, silent. We know now who is cool. The All the masks are off. And, but we must persevere with our prayers towards the Pope, even to those who, who we might think are making errors and place ourselves at the feet of the cross. But what you saw in Paris in Friday was just a tip of the iceberg. And this is why, that is the reason why the Blessed Virgin Mary, and no one knows that better than you, you've talked about it enough in your shows and in your conferences, that the Virgin Mary is being sent by heaven again and again because now that it's not yeah. anymore, the time uh, of admonition for the future. No, it's uh, well said. Well said. We're in the midst of it right now in the storm. And it's funny because uh, I've mentioned this before, but we are literally the frogs in the pot because, you know, you go back 20 years ago and you, you live a life in, in the world today from being beamed from 20 years ago. You'd be like, what? Where am I? Sodom and Gomorrah? But you, you don't sense that because it's a very gradual, even though it's sped up quite a bit, it's still very gradual. You know, we, we become a little numb to it and uh, we have to kind of pull ourselves out and not, I don't think we need to pull ourselves out and scrupulously be angry and whatnot. Righteous anger is one thing, but we need to be men and women of action. Joyful. The gospel, again, is good news. We are a people of joy, but we need action. And, and so much of this show has been, you know, you're in the foxhole. What do we do? We have these sacramentals. 
we have these devotions and these prayers that we need to deploy, if you will, to use a military term, daily, multiple times a day. And that kind of leads us to the final sacramental I wanted to talk to you about, and that is the St. Benedict's Medal. Yeah. How apropos relative to what occurred in Paris. <laughs> Very much so. It's an exorcist, an exorcist medal, which um, also the Virgin Mary is asking everyone, including Marie-Julie Jarini and Father Michel, uh, to echo the request from heaven for everyone to wear one, of course, blessed. Uh, this is a medal that cannot be withstood by the devil either. Mm -hmm. But what is to come? Also, the Blessed Virgin Mary is inviting the faithful, particularly those who work in farmlands, uh, who, do, who grow agriculture or who raise uh, cattle, uh, to place on your property, in your farmland, you know, in the shape of a cross, various uh, medals of San Benedict bury them, in the shape of the cross after they are blessed, so mm. to in a way protect and bless your property in that. For what is to come, this is promised your properties will be protected, your livestock will likewise be protected during the events that are meaningful. So, so what you're saying, because I have a St. Benedict's medals pray, like sort of buried around the perimeter of my property. I have, I have pretty good sized property, I've got the chickens and all that, and the bees. Um, you're saying maybe dead center, I could create. A little cross. In addition, you could do that. I think what you've done is perfect. Well, well I, I'm to listen. I'm going for broke. <laughs> X marks the spot. I, I don't think. I think what you did is lovely. You should do it if you want. I don't think that God is the sort of person you know who, <laughs> you can see one of these machines with a baseball cap saying, mm, sh -sh -sh -sh. "No, no, no, that doesn't count because you didn't do it in a point." <laughs> I don't think so. I think that God is a loving Father, and He, he sees His children do everything the best they can. But now that you're here, if you want to do it, that that would be a good idea, and it's not much of an effort. And no. that is what the version did ask um, Marie Jeanne to echo to the faithful. So, but always wear it upon yourself. It's a tremendous protection against the enemies um, of God. It's uh, an exorcist medal, and it will protect you. Uh, and you shall do not either um, think that those are amulets or that it is superstition. All this that we that Bill and I have been talking about is formally approved and recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Those are instruments, very much like a dagger or a shield or a sword arm. Those are the weapons of modern times. So do not mistake this for uh, uh, tools of superstition. Those are tools of faith, and uh, it's a response as well to God saying, "I've heard." I accept and I will accord. Yeah. And it's not, you know, for some of our Protestant brothers and sisters, it's not idols or anything like that. You look in the scriptures, you know, God had, had, had the Hebrews paint blood over their door. That's, it's, it's a visible sign. Um, the bones of saints healing people, the shadows at St. Peter, I guess it was. I mean, healing people, you know, God utilizes the, the stuff of, of flesh, the, the, the material, right? And that's actually part of what a sacrament is. There's an, an exterior and, and, and a spiritual side to every sacrament. So that's what that's what we're talking about. And I'm not a theologian, so don't get me off on some crazy tangent that I can't support. But but you get the idea. <laughs> I'm sure someone in the comments will actually maybe explore that a little bit deeper than this this dad that you're talking to right now. But um, so St. Benedict's Medal, huge. Um, what about prayers. I mean, we talked about the rosary, we talked about the chaplet. I have a special devotion to the shoulder wound of Christ, of St. Bernard, that, that beautiful crusader saint, St. Bernard de Clairvaux, uh, now the Frenchman, right? I believe he was France. Um, so, <laughs> not English, no. So to, let's talk about the shoulder wound, because I believe you also have a devotion. Yes, uh, and this comes from, uh, with me, it's very recently acquired. Uh, I found out about it, not from a um, the same from Clairvaux, but mostly from Marie-Julie Jeanne. Mm. Uh, she, our Lord appeared to her and explained to her that this was, of all the wounds, one of the most difficult pair for him, where you could see uh, three fingers wide. You could even see some of the bones on his clavicle, on his uh, mm. uh, shoulder. And he had to bear still on that particular shoulder the, the weight of the cross. 
So um, there are there is a list of promises, uh, which is quite lengthy. I could I have them in my book as well. At the end of the book, which I, the promises that Christ gives for all those who will um, have a devotion for this particular unknown uh, devotion and love um, to the wound of his uh, left shoulder. So um, yes, I have it, and uh, remarkably enough, it has. It sounds very fanatical, so I will not enter into a detail, but I, I can tell you that um, although I, I always look at things in a very critical way, perhaps sometimes too much, which is an irony considering what I'm doing, but I've seen events which to this day I cannot explain, which have saved uh, me personally uh, from bodily harm, unexplainable. Um, I, can, I, I give it credence to this. It, it was clearly evident that because of it. I invite everyone to read about it and devote yourself to it. It's a devotion that our Lord, all Marie Jeanne, that ever so few people know about. Yeah. It has immense value and promises protection to those simply who remember and pray uh, in memory of the wound of this particular wound of our Lord Jesus Christ. You're comforting Jesus. You know, remember, God is outside of time. Do you think about this? Unpack this. God is outside of time. Both of us talks about this, right? He's outside of time. We're stuck in time. Yeah. This is how our prayer, a prayer from when we're five years old could help us when we're 50. And maybe the prayers when we're 50 could theoretically have helped us when we're 20 because God sees all of the time as one moment. So when you meditate and you comfort Jesus as he's carrying that cross, for, for him, it's in time. It's in the moment. You are standing, not spitting and throwing stones at, at the Messiah as he carries that cross. No, you're worshiping him. You're comforting him. And think about that a little bit. And that's what some of these beautiful devotions, when we pray the rosary of the chapel, you're in time because God's outside of time. So you're in the time of that devotion in a certain sense. It's a beautiful thought. There's hmm. another prayer that I have a great deal of... Uh... Uh, devotion to, and uh, talking about exorcism and uh, fight. It's a San Michael the Archangel prayer. Mm. Powerful, it. powerful. It is a prayer. A great that, story from Leo the Thirteenth. Why don't you share the story? Yes, and not only Leo the Thirteenth, also Marie Julie Shahini. She had the exact same experience, but a great deal more detail than uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. And Leo the Thirteenth supported Marie Julie Shahini. He did. <laughs> a little connection. Absolutely. And uh, I think that, that one of the reasons, actually, was because he found out the experience that she herself lived, which was similar to what he did. And that experience you mentioned, uh, and that's where the St. Michael the Archangel prayer comes from, uh, was when Leo XIII, His Holiness, the Pope, witnessed uh, uh, when he, after Mass, he, he fell in a sort of, uh, he lost consciousness. And mm. while he was losing, con he lost consciousness, he witnessed a conversation of Satan taking place with Jesus Christ. And in this conversation, the devil was furious because he just saw uh, our Lord, and you're talking about this uh, linear idea of time that we, we humans know, and the fact of no timing in heaven as to the way God sees it at that time. Probably the 13th saw the rage of the fallen angel, Lucifer. Mm seeing Christ come back from the Assumption and taking possession of what belonged to him. He was victory, triumph. And Lucifer was furious. And he said, you have taken away from me the power that I was promised. Give me your church for 100 years and you will see that I will manage in that sh short period of time, I will manage to destroy it and ravage it and leave nothing but sand and ashes. So Jesus Christ, according to the tale of uh, or the witness of His Holiness Pope Leo XIII said, after silence and deep thought, said, Very well, you will have 100 years for you to test my church, so that at the end of this period of time you will no longer be able to harm. <laughs> when is that period of time started? And that's, uh, we all talk about that. Was it 1917? I've heard so many different theories from different people. And Daniel O'Connor, I think it was, what, 29 or something like that? I forget. I don't think we are meant to know. When I spoke ah, about that to yeah. Father Michel, uh, Father René Laurentin, Father Laurent, <laughs> I remember like it was, I, I miss the man. He was extraordinary and he had a 
although he was not very demonstrative, but he had a tremendous sense of humor. When we did discuss this particular conversation, he started laughing. He couldn't help himself. He, he, said, he told me, Xavier, that's always the nature of man, wanting to know the dates. And that's why I, uh, he told me, j'ai horreur des prophéties. I have horror, profound horror of prophecies because they always lead men to madness. We are not meant to know. All we know is we are meant to know what God allowed us to hear, which is a hundred years of testing. It could be, it could start in 100 years from now, it could have started 50 years ago. We don't know. And I think he was wise. It's funny you say that because when I was on the, the podcast you had with all the, the captains of different shows and whatnot with Father Rodrigue, I asked him the question about what does imminence mean? And he laughed. And I couldn't, I couldn't clarify. I wasn't saying I want a day. My thought was, well, is it days, weeks, months, years? That's all I was, I was seeking for or searching for. But it was funny because he laughed and then he just he took off. <laughs> but he answered you. He answered you. He, he answered did. You. He did. He, he said, did. Months, not years. Remember? Yeah. Yeah. He did. He did. He did. But that was funny. Uh, it just brought me back to that moment. Actually, um, any other prayers that uh -huh. you and devotions that you incorporate in your life that you have found extremely edifying and efficacious? Um, with me and with my family. What we do, I take my little ones every first Saturday of every month, I do confession. Mm. Every first Saturday, I take my little boy to have a hat, but we make a ritual of it. I know I have my heart as well. Mm. I first began to bribe the little ones with uh, Starbucks chocolate chip cookies and something. It started like this. Good started choice. Like this. It started innocently. Like now they do not want anything to eat. We just drink uh, some coffee at home for me and for their mother. Uh, we do that. Every first Saturday of the month, as the version asks, we go afterwards, we meditate on the 15 mysteries. Uh, of the passion of Christ, of the life of Christ, the way our lady in Fatima asked for a minimum of 15 minutes. John Henry Weston did a beautiful show, uh, which we put on the television. We retransmitted from the laptop to the large TV, and he just talks about every single 15 mystery of the, of the rosary. And the, watch. and the pictures he puts are exquisite, mm. he even puts some excerpt of the passion of the Christ, the movie. The children watch, and they've seen it a million times. Every time, it never fails. Still watch like this, like that, and meditate on everything that John Henry said. And then we pray the Rosary, five mysteries, and then we go to mass. That is one devotion that we do, with utmost devotion, profound love, and it makes us more united. My children, my son is an older boy. He's 15 years old. He's very innocent. What I adore about him among many other things. In church, when he is dressed in red and white with his uh, altar boy outfit in front of everyone, he comes to me and we tend to sit at the front because my wife is speaker so that she doesn't have to travel all the way from the line. He comes to me in front of everyone. He tells me, Daddy, je t'aime. Oh, I love you. He gives me hugs in front of everyone. 15 years mm -hmm. ago. It's, um, it's uh, you know, memories are like photos. As long as I'm able to open my eyes, those memories will never leave. So those are the, some of the devotions we do. We give them relevant importance. My children are absolutely convinced, absolutely convinced without a shadow of a doubt, that every time they receive directly in the mouth of the Holy Eucharist, communion, they receive really the, the person of God, God through His Son. Those are our devotions, the principle, the cornerstones of our devotion. And it makes our family mm. And those hugs had their origins with the sweetness of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> I, say, I say that joking, but there's a great lesson in that as a parent because, you know, we can, we can scare our children away from faith if we're too rigid. And, 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 you know, where that's a great lesson, you know, creating a wonderful moment, you know, as a, as a you know, we celebrate. We, we went to confession. Let's celebrate Sunday at my household. I got the charcuterie board loaded with food. We're cooking, you know, where Father Tom comes over. We're on the porch, maybe having, maybe having a cigar, but we're just, it's a celebration because it's the Lord's day. 
you know, again, gospel, good news. So um, there's a great lesson in that, and especially with raising children, for sure. What I loved about Father Tom is uh, he is also phlegmatic. He has a man deep with conviction, but he knows also how to play uh, with his nephew. Oh, he does. And to <laughs> score the uh, football. I've seen him do that with his nephews and even with you, Joe. And uh, he's so complimentary. And particularly in these times of ours, so we cannot be always dark and somber and gloom. We have to prepare and be aware of what, what is, lies ahead of us, which is going to be very difficult. But I think part of our strength uh, is the demonstration of our faith through good humor, through <laughs> strength of character. Through Christ was a man from what the Gospels and the, read, and the teachings and the writings tells us, a man who was also full of life, full of life. And he had a sense of humor, according to some of the mystics who've spoken with him. Father Michel tells me that God the Father has a tremendous sense of humor. Yeah, that's awesome. So you're right. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know, I, I think um, on a certain sense, I think we have to prepare for death. Now, always that's always the case as a sober human being because your, your days are numbered. But, um, you know, in my discussions with my adult children, it's like, boys... You know, we have to prepare spiritually, mentally. You know, what if you have that call? You know, you read Eusebius and you read about St. Blandina. You know, there was a persecution going on in Lyon, France, your, your beautiful country. And, um, you know, this little girl is brought into to be basically tortured. And, and all the other Christians, the big thing was about, you know, what remaining steadfast, not denying Christ. I mean, that was the... That was the test. And that, and they were scared because this little girl, she's little, she's going to break. And they prayed and whatnot. And what happened? They brought Blandina out and they tortured her. And they put her in baskets and, and she would she'd come back to the room and she lit them all up with her faith. And she, of course, that St. Blandina, you read about her and you see this. But, you know, I hope we're not entering in those days. But the truth is, it looks like the world is headed in that direction. You can think of the Gulag. You can think of Nazi Germany. You know, you can think of what's going on with the world. It's a very cold world. So being sober and preparing for, at minimum, white martyrdom, the persecution, but potentially even red martyrdom is something that it, it's, it's something that you need to think about. You know, there is um, a school of thought, um, police officers, I'll give you a story. They do what's called IPSC training, shooting training. They'll go through and targets will pop up and whatnot. Years ago, as they would shoot, they would collect their spent shells, casings, because they didn't want to clean it up later. So they'd shoot a couple targets. They'd pick up their shells, go to the next target, pick up their shells. And what did they find out? They found out in firefights in the world outside of the training facilities, they saw dead cops with spent shells in their hands. So what's happened is in crisis, you default to your training. And we can look at that spiritually. I always tell my kids, because we have a lot of deer near us, it's like mentally go through the practice of when you're driving and you see a deer, mentally hit the brake. Don't turn because the swerving is what kills you. It's what kills someone driving or walking. Hit the brake. And you do, you do that rep re repeatedly in your mind. I think today is the same way. You need to kind of prepare yourselves because there might be a test. And certainly in the end, we're all going to be tested right at, at our deathbed and who knows what suffering can come from that. So I think that there's some, some good healthy psychology in, in thinking through that process, especially today. I think there is also a lot of hope. I, you know, if there is anything that I would recommend your viewers, because you have a very, very special podcast channel here. And I suspect that the people who watch are likewise very special. They are called to watch you. Um, and that is part of, I think, the message of hope. That among other things, uh, the version has been ordered to bring forth to humanity. I would say to your viewers, keep an eye on your show regularly. It's time. It's meant. And it's not just for popularity's sake. It's simply because the time will come when your bill will report the events that will take place around the world that will give hope and faith and the relevant instructions for those uh, to maintain their faith firm. It will be your mission 
not just yours, it will be others as well that have also podcasts and other instruments to bring to the attention of the faithful that which has been sent to God. But make no mistake, you are one of them. And I well, wish- not, not by choice. It's funny how God works. Even with the men's conference 20 years ago, it was sort of like, I think you should run this because the guy was moving to Florida. A great, great man, Jim Manhart. So I was like, ooh, I was like 30 something. I'm like, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and that's sort of been my life. Uh, but it harkens back to one of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 2.10. I say, I've said it several times. For we are his handiwork created in Christ Jesus for the good works that he has prepared for us in advance that we should live in him. We just have to say yes or no. You know, it's not, you know, God has prepared a path for you and you can either say yes or no. And that's kind of, you know, I, I think that's what I'm doing here because I am, I'm not worthy. But I'm a bonehead, you know, I'm a dad, you know, I'm, but, um, but there's need, you know, I know I, I like to rotate around podcasts when I'm driving and things like that, because you always want more information. You want more, you, you know, you'll learn and you're edified by great testimonies and great people like yourself. So it's been my pleasure and I'm humble um, to even be here. So thank you for that. Yes, man. You see too many times in other channels, people that are trying to... Yeah. In your case, and I can tell your viewers this on a, as a testimony since I've known you now for a while, uh, what is one of the things that I like the most about your person and your, your show and with you, who is behind the camera right now listening to us, <laughs> now I'm probably laughing, is that your only ambition, the only ambition is to do good, is to do God's will, and is to bring the faithful to their salvation. You have no other ambition other than that in this particular mission of yours. And that shows. And no, I appreciate that. And everyone who watches this knows. And that is why uh, I invite everyone to keep closely their attention on your show. Because when the miracle of um, uh, in Garavandal, in Medjugorje, and in other places will take place, you'll be there to report it. And you will echo the instructions to the messages that heaven is bringing for the people through their visionaries. You will be instrumental in bringing many souls to salvation. God willing, I'll be there if, if he wants me to, for sure. It, it's been an amazing pleasure to have you again, my brother. Um, I, I, know, I know you have another podcast to do, um, but I just wanted to thank you. It's it's every time people get a chance to hear you, it's it's their pleasure as well. So I think everyone wins on that one. Thank you, Bill. You're absolutely terrific. Please give all my love to your wife and your superb children, and my and a warm hug to Father Tom, if you would. I will. I'll see him in a few minutes. I see them on the porch already through through the stained glass window, <laughs> having some fun, throwing the football around actually. But uh, listen, you passed your love to, to your beautiful wife and your two munchkins. <laughs> and my friend, we will see each other soon. By all means. And give my best to Q and his mother. I will. God bless you. God bless everyone listening to this. Please uh, don't be afraid. to Pick up this amazing book, Revelations by Xavier Razor. Well, it's phenomenal. And check out his channel. Can you repeat the uh, channel one more time? Yes. It's called All Crooks Ave Media. Oh, Crooks Ave Media. Uh, it's it's selected as a favorite. It's like funny thing when you when you put something as a favorite, you forget the names. It's like your phone number. I don't even know my wife's phone number because it's saved as my wife, right? So it's like GPS. I, I used to know where I was driving. Now GPS makes me stupid. I don't know where I'm going unless I'm watching the GPS. Kind of similar in that sense. So thank you, everyone. Xavier, God bless you, my brother. God bless everyone. We will see you soon. We have some exciting shows coming up soon. God bless. God bless. Thank you.